Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to another one of my introductory astronomy lectures. This whole sequence that I've been doing recently about the nature of the history of the discovery of what light is certainly doesn't seem to be a lot about astronomy. But let's actually take understand one very important thing. Remember, the moon is 200,000 miles away. The sun is 93 million miles away. Jupiter is, not, is five times the distance between the Earth and the sun. And the stars are light years away. So we're never going to touch these objects. So what we need to do is we need to understand how light works because that's our messenger. That's how we know what's going on. So if, if somehow light interacts with material, which we know it does, then we, and then we need to understand how light interacts with material because if it interacts, maybe it carries that information to us. So we need to understand as much as we can about this thing that we call light so that we can actually determine what the thing that, do, that happened to the light when it reflected or sourced off that distant material. So let's continue our quest to understand the nature of light. All right, so last time we ended up with James Clerk Maxwell's equations for the elect for electromagnetism and how they are, can be solved to show that light is actually a propagation of an electromagnetic wave. And that just determines, that pretty much is said that any light can be any, any wavelength, uh, basically as long and any frequency, but the frequency and wavelength of light are related by the speed of light. So the thing is, is there's two questions. Well, what's the speed of light and what's it moving in? So everyone, every theory of light that deals with any kind of wave motion assumes some sort of medium, like water waves, you can't have waves in water without water. You can't have waves in, uh, can't have sound waves in air without air. So you need to have some sort of, logically, you've got to have some sort of medium in which to traverse light. And anybody who said otherwise in the latter part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, was looked at as kind of crazy. But specifically in the latter part of the 19th century, because here's what happened. This thing that we would call the medium of light was, called, was termed the luminiferous ether. That's a wonderful word, luminiferous ether. And it just basically meant a, a, a material in which light propagated, but that nothing else dealt with. Like, it wasn't affected by matter at all. The luminiferous ether went through us, it went past us. It kind of was like the force from Star Wars or something like that. It just, it was everywhere. And so, but it did nothing to anything except light. Um, so this was fascinating as a concept, and, and people thought, well, it's kind of an odd thing because the Earth is moving in its orbit around the Sun, so as the Earth moves, it must be moving through this ether. Okay, so we also we knew from Galileo that if you move through something, you can see a relative motion of things, and that's an interesting thought. So we also thought that, well, maybe the moon, the, the, there is a, that the, on the Earth, that this luminiferous ether does not have like turbulent winds, otherwise we might see light bouncing around in strange patterns. So we could assume that the, the luminiferous ether was relatively steady or constant throughout the cosmos and that the Earth simply moved through it. And so in a certain sense we would look at the luminiferous ether as, as a fixed reference system. It is the thing of the cosmos and that light travels through. This became kind of a mainstay of 19th century figure, physics. So people went about to saying, well, I want to know how fast the Earth is moving through the luminiferous, luminiferous ether. And to see, and, and therefore, if it must be moving, then we should be able to detect this movement. And how shall we detect this movement? Well, it's kind of simple. It was devised in 1887 by Albert Michelson and Edward Morley, and they created what was called an interferometer. And they took a bright source of light, and they pointed it in one direction and bounced it through a whole series of mirrors back and forth. And they took the same source of light. And before they bounced it through this series, they made a, like a special mirror, a half-silvered mirror. So the light went through one side of the mirror, some of it went to the right, and some of it went straight through. That's a half-silvered mirror. So a, a mirror that passes half, partly through and partly against. In that same sense, it, 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 you can look at, say, uh, a, a window facing outside as a half-silvered mirror because you can both see your reflection in the window and see things outside given, given proper conditions. So 
maybe you just want to formalize this to make sure that you get half the light going through and half the light going through, uh, half the light transmitting and the other half reflecting. And so that's a special setup of glass. And so in 1887, Michelson and Morey were able to create such a glass. And what they did is they had a bright source of light that went through this half silvered mirror and bounced around on another series of mirrors before coming back through the half to the half silvered mirror and going off to a detector. Meanwhile, they had another thing that was there, that was 90 degrees away from that. So there's one group of light bouncing going like this and another going 90 degrees like that. So basically they extended, it's as though they, they had went through the half-silvered mirror, went down a long series of things and said like they folded it by having all these bouncing mirrors. So it's like they had a very long travel, travel space for the light to go this way back and forth and a very long travel to, uh, distance to go this way. So it was an extremely long distance that they traveled, that the light traveled, and then it got recombined. So as it went back through the half-silvered mirror, it went over here and put, got, was detected on a detector. Now, remember the superposition principle. The superposition principle says that if two waves meet and they have the same at, the, at one point and their waves are in phase, then they, the amplitudes add. In fact, Amplitudes always add, but sometimes if they're if they're in this if they're in phase, then they add and they become twice as big. So if they have the same amplitude here when they meet, it's twice as high. But if they meet and they're out of phase, say by 90 degrees, then when they meet, there's nothing because they cancel each other out. And this happens in water waves, and it was known to also happen in light waves. That's the diffraction effect and the, the also well, specifically Young's double slit experiment in 1803 described showed that to be the case. So so therefore, we knew that this kind of effect occurred and they were going to capitalize on it. They said, okay, we can actually look for this interference pattern of the superposition of these things and let's time it and tune it so that the initial impulse is that they're either in phase or out of phase. And what they did is they said, okay, let's set up the apparatus so that the light goes down one traverse and goes down the other, and they bounce and recombine. And maybe what you want to do is then tune the distances so they're exactly the same and you make like, maybe you make it so it's out of phase, completely out of phase and you get no signal. Great, so now all you have to do is wait, is you wait for the earth to rotate. You wait for the earth to move through space. And if the earth is moving, through space and therefore through the luminiferous ether, the speed will cause a wind. There will be an ether wind and the wind will have the light. If it's going into the wind, the light will struggle to go into the wind just in the same way a bird struggles to fly into the wind and it will struggle to go into the wind and then it'll come back faster and that will push, but the light going across won't have the same problem. So the phases, the two beams of light that are 90 degrees apart, one of them will be more into the wind than the other. And so therefore, you should see an interference pattern. So you make it so that there is none. You set it up and then you take trial after trial, time after time. You rotate the entire apparatus as you go, as at various times in the year around the Earth, as the Earth goes around the orbit, around the sun. And they checked and checked and checked for an appearance of the dot. And what did they find? Nothing. It didn't matter where the Earth's orbit, Earth was in its orbit. It didn't matter which way they oriented the, the apparatus. They found no interference pattern. They found no positive, after they calibrated it, they found no change. So there was zero effect, which meant that there was no ether wind. Therefore you couldn't, there was no adding of the speed of the Earth of, onto the light as it went into the luminif luminiferous ether. Because if the light was going this way and the Earth was going that way, you'd add their two speeds together and the Earth, don't, you don't add the speed of the light going that's traversed to it. But if you're going with it, you add the speed together. So therefore, they should have had a difference, but they never did. So the luminiferous ether was disproved in all at once but in 1887, by Michelson and Morley, looking for the effect of the luminiferous ether, meaning looking for the change in speed of light through time as the Earth moved through this theorized, this putative, this imagined luminiferous ether, and they discovered that it didn't exist. That's an amazing discovery. So, okay, so that, that's kind of a weird thought. So they said, well, with speed, we said, well, what's the speed of light? 
Well, let's take a step back and look at the speed of light because when we find that, there, that the speed of light, basically they, what Michelson Morley found was that the speed of light was constant no matter which way you looked. Fascinating, didn't matter which way you looked, the speed of light was constant, it was always the same. Whether it was going across the movement or with the movement or kitty corner to the movement, didn't matter. The speed of light was the same. Really fascinating. Okay, so what is the speed of light thing? Let's take it back. Let's take it way the back. So 1638, way, way back then, Galileo, remember him? Galileo actually tried to measure the speed of light. He tried to measure the speed of light by putting people with lanterns on top of hilltops, miles apart, and so he would say, okay, well, I'm gonna open my lantern, and when you see it, you open your lantern, and I'll time it. I'm gonna time it with my, my heartbeat. That's all he had in 1638. And to him, with people miles apart, he couldn't find any difference. In fact, it was too fast for his heartbeat. In fact, it was more like the, it, it was about at the same time as it took for someone to actually lift it. It was about a heartbeat or so. So from his measurements, he said, if it's not infinite, it's really fast. That's pretty good measurement for Galileo in 1638. Very smart. In 1676, just about 30 years later, for, uh, in, yeah, 40 years later, Ole Romer, using telescopes, uh, actually determined that the speed of light had to be very fast, and he actually made a measurement of the speed of light. How he did it was he was timing the transits of the Galilean satellites. Because people thought, well, we should use the Galilean satellites as a natural clock, because if you're out on the ocean, you might be able to use them as a clock by observing the timing transits, and that would help you with finding, say, longitude. So the timing of the transits of the Galilean satellites around Jupiter can be used as a clock. All right. So then you could make a prediction as to when, on what day, at exactly what time, these transits should occur. And what Romer found was that they were different than the predictions. So you knew that it took only so many days for Io to go around, and you knew it only took so many days for Callisto and Ganymede and Europa to go around. So why were you observing them at the wrong time? And that happened because the cumulative effect of the Earth's orbit around the Sun added times to the travel time because the light took extra time to travel to the location you're at now as opposed to the location you were at. So that added time to the measurement. And it's, a, it's an increase in time as you travel around the orbit. It's not all at once. It's not like, okay, now we're at this distance. No, it's a cumulative effect of errors in measurement as a result of when the light left Jupiter and when it was received. So as these cumulative effects add up, they add up in one way as you're going, as Earth is going towards Jupiter, and they subtract as you come as Earth is going away from Jupiter. So they kind of go in a cyclical pattern. But by measuring the transit timings, or the sum of all the transit differentials that occurred between the timings of the, of, of the transits of Io, you could determine just how long it took for the Earth to go, for light to travel, the diameter of Earth's orbit. And what Ole Romer found was that if you add up all these transit time, uh, these transit timing errors, that ends up being, well, if you think about the entire diameter of the Earth's orbit, he deduced that there was, that the speed of light, because the diameter divided by the speed uh, and the timing transits, shall, he said, that I think it was roughly about 22 minutes, so he was off by a bit. Uh, it, the total, total discrepancy was 22 minutes or throughout the year, meaning how much, how much increase and decrease it was from the expected value. And so from that, he determined if it's 93 million miles times two, which is 150 million miles, uh, yeah, 100, 200 million miles, then he determined roughly that the speed of light is 200,000 kilometers per second, which is pretty close. It's very fast, but pretty close. But he used the, the errors in the timing of transits of, of Europa or Io around, 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 uh, around Jupiter. All right, so that was a good measurement. And in 1728, 50 years later, remember James Bradley measuring stellar aberration, trying to find parallax, but found aberration. The only way that he could account for the fact that the, the telescope was moving and that the light would have to instead, it have to, the pitch of the telescope had to be changed in order for the, the apparent position of the light to be in the correct place, he determined that the speed of light had to be about 300,000 kilometers per second in order for it to work. 
All right, so that's James, that's James Bradley since 1728. In 1850, Hippolyte uh, Fisso and Leon Foucault used the difference in speeds of light in air and water as they bounce, as uh, when they took a beam of light, bounced it off of a rotating mirror, passed it through light, passed it through water, then that light went to a very distant mirror, bounced off that, came back to the rotating mirror, distant meaning miles away, bounced back off this rotating mirror that may have changed position uh, and and uh, basically had teeth in it or marks, and so there were only specific places when the bouncing could occur. And then uh, by the change in position, when it passed through the light, uh, passed back to the detector right next to the source, they could use the change in path length combined with the uh, the rotation of the mirror, which was like a sawtooth, and so it would only bounce off of specific teeth. That would actually tell them the speed of light. And so Fizeau and Foucault determined in 1850 the speed of light this way. And then finally, the speed of light in about 1900 was determined by Lewis Essen and A.G. Gordon Smith uh, by, using electron by using electronics. And what they used was called a cavity, a cavity resonance wave, wave meter. And that's basically an electric circuit that has an oscillating pattern. And that oscillating pattern is inside of a physical diam physical space. And that physical space, if you have a wave that's oscillating inside a physical space, you must have standing wavelengths. Just like on a guitar string that when it gets plucked, the ends of the guitar string are stuck to the guitar. So therefore you have standing waves on the guitar string. In the same sense, in this oscillating resonance wave meter, you have standing wavelengths of light. So you know what the frequency is in order to make the standing wavelengths occur inside of there. And then you just measure the size of the wave meter, which is really small, but yet you say it must be an integral number of waves inside of there. And through that, they were able to measure the speed of light. And that is one of the more modern measurements, and it gets you about 299,000 kilometers per second, very close to 300,000 kilometers per second. And this is a very close to a very modern way of actually measuring these speeds by looking at cavity resonance measurements in any event. So the speed of light then had been well established and well understood all the way up through 1887. And when Michelson and Morley found, well, wait a second, what is this speed of light? And they found it was independent. And this is the key idea out of the Michelson-Morley experiment, is that the speed of light was completely independent of the direction in which you were looking, uh, which you were making your measurement. Now they should have seen some sort of addition or subtraction to the speed of light, given that the Earth was moving through the luminiferous ether, and since it was moving through it, the light should have at the, wave, at the waves in the ether, we should have been either catching up to the waves or receding away from the waves. And that did not occur. So therefore, the luminiferous ether as a thing could not exist. Ah, that's a crazy thought. That's a big, big, big thought. And that actually was solved by this guy named Albert Einstein, which we'll talk about next time. See you soon.